Well, good morning. Happy Palm Sunday. Glad to see everybody here. Why don't we all stand up this morning and worship together? I heard. Jesus came and won to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He punched me. for a moment. Oh, good morning to you. It is good to be with you this morning. If you are a guest with us in this place, my name is House. I'm the student pastor here, and we are absolutely delighted that you have come to worship with us. Whether you're here in person or whether you're online, we consider you an honored guest, and it is simply great to have you in this place. It is a great fellowship, people of God, as we come together to worship a risen Savior. And it's not just next week that we celebrate it is an everyday thing we celebrate a risen savior and so we give him praise for that 
I do want to remind you of a couple things. Uh, one, we are observing the Lord's Supper today for Palm Sunday. Uh, we have the little cups in the back, so if you're a believer and you didn't grab one of those when we stand to worship, if you want to just walk back there and grab one, uh, we'll be observing that uh, during the message today. Also, ladies, don't forget your Bible studies tonight and uh, tomorrow morning. And then most importantly, don't forget next week is Easter. Invite somebody, find a neighbor, a friend, a co-worker, invite them to come, and I would even challenge you to, to offer to meet them somewhere. Not everybody likes to come into the church by themselves, but offer to meet them outside or meet them at the Dunkin' Donuts and come over with them and give them an opportunity to come and walk in the doors with you. Uh, just a great opportunity for people to come together this next Sunday who may not often come, and so we want to just be prepared for that and take advantage of that all to the glory of God. We are grateful to be in this place this morning, so we want to give God praise and glory. So would you join me as we pray? God, you are so faithful and you are so good. And I thank you for all the blessings that we have. God, I thank you for this Palm Sunday, even as we begin this holy week of remembering that you made your way to the cross. It did not catch you by surprise, but you went there intentionally. For each one of us. And so we give you praise for your death and for your resurrection, for the sacrifice, for the forgiveness of sins. But God, it's also a reminder that you know of our suffering. As we have called to suffer with you and to glory in that. And so we give you praise for everything that takes place in our life because you are sovereign and you are good. And for this moment that we have to corporately come together to worship you, to lift high your name, to sing our praises unto you, and to open up your word, and to hear what you'd have to speak to our hearts, and to observe your Lord's Supper in remembrance of you this morning, we pray that in every aspect that you'd be glorified. And that you would help us to lay down our burdens and our Maybe the walls we've built around our hearts and invite you in and to be reminded of who you are and the great love that you have for us and that you desire to change us into your image. And God, as we continue throughout this week, I pray that you would open up our eyes and the opportunities to invite someone next week. And whatever it takes, God, Help us to just simply show love and grace and give them an opportunity to hear this good news of Jesus Christ. I know there's a lot going on in our lives. I know there's a lot going on in this world. May we continue to follow after you, to be your hands and feet, and to love those around us. And again, God, for this hour that we have, to be your church and worshiping you together before you send us out. Fill this place with your presence. And be glorified in this place, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And now would you stand as we continue to worship together. This next song, um, I'd like to introduce a new song to y'all. And this morning we're going we're gonna to teach you the chorus of this new song. The song is called He Is. It's by... David Crowder. Um, we're going to be singing the whole thing next week, um, but this week I'd like to teach you the chorus of it. Um, I'm going to sing it, and I'm going to invite everybody to sing to the best of their ability with us, right? It goes like this. He is hope for the hopeless, rest for the weary, help for the hurting. He is, he is mending the broken, Bearing the burdens, all that you're needing. Sing it again.
Oh, 
attraction for me. For the dear Lamb of God left His glory above to bear it through dark Calvary. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged
grace draw near and bless your name. Dear God, we just want to thank you so much for that wonderful, wonderful cross. Not just because of the cross, but because of the person who paid that ultimate price so that we can be here today to worship you, to celebrate not just the sacrifice, but the hope that came after the sacrifice three days later. And we ask that as you, as you speak your word to us today, that we have our hearts open and our minds open to hear what you really have to say to us so that when we leave this place, we can continue to glorify you and to celebrate that wonderful cross and that wonderful person who paid the ultimate price for us. It's your name that I pray today, Lord. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. You've got to know the rest of the story to call it a wonderful cross. And aren't we grateful for the resurrection and thankful for what Christ has done for us? Amen. Amen. And that's what we are wanting to remember and to celebrate today. And so um, I would ask if you take your Bibles and open them to the book of Luke, to the book of Luke. In chapter 22, verse 14, Luke gives us the account of Jesus instituting the Lord's Supper. Um, So, and I know you've been standing, but let's just stand for one more minute, okay? Stand with me. Uh, We are so grateful to have the Word of God. Amen. Luke says, when the hour had come, Jesus sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And and he said to them, with fervent desire, I've desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. There's so much right there. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it's fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And he took the cup and he gave thanks And he said, take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, gave it to them and said, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, then he took the cup and after supper, and he said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And then he said, but behold, the hand of my betrayer is with me on the table. And truly the son of man goes as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. Well, Then they all began to question among themselves which one it was that would do such a thing. And then they got into arguing about who was the greatest. And we realize all over again why Christ had to die for our sin. Because we're also sinful and selfish amen you may be seated um you know for as long as i can remember and i was actually remembering 1983 was my first year of pastoring a church pastor gardens baptist church in palm beach gardens florida where it never got this cold by the way but uh, um And as long as I have been pastoring, I have scheduled the Lord's Supper on the Sunday before Easter. Um, You might think you're in a rut, but uh, that's okay. Um, As a church here at Southern Crescent, our bylaws say we observe the Lord's Supper every quarter. And, And don't you love that word, observe? We're going to observe the Lord's Supper this morning. 
Um, it really just means to respect or to, to keep, right? But it's not a word that we use in that context today. I don't think any of us have said, you know what? We're observing the Masters Golf Tournament this weekend. Or we observed the opening of baseball season this week. Now, when we think of the word observe, we think of it in another way. It, all right? it just means you watch something take place. We've observed that happening. You're not involved. You're simply an observer, right? And, and if we're not careful, or at least this is my fear, if we're not careful that when we come to the, when we come to the table, we end up just observing, right? We, we choose to be an audience rather than participants. We end up being watchers more than worshipers. Um, truth is, this is a time to involve ourselves, to invest ourselves, right? It is, a, it is a time to be a participant, to be a partaker, because the Lord himself breaks the bread and invites us to eat. Then he offers us the cup and invites us to drink. And if it isn't something that we involve ourselves in, if we just observe it, then it becomes just a routine, right? Something that we observe because it's in the bylaws, and the bylaws tells us what we need to do that, right? And it ends up being a mindless habit, an exercise without meaning. And it's just, if it is that thing we do every so often in church, then basically we've taken the most precious gift we've ever been given and we've thrown it in the dirt. They say attitude is everything, right? So what I want to ask you to do this morning is just to open your hearts and minds and involve yourself. I want you to put yourself at the table with the disciples. You see, because when you said yes to the call of God and came to faith in Christ, it came with an invitation to sit at the table and to be a part of it all. So please don't just observe. And don't misunderstand what I say when I say this, but please don't just observe. First of all, I'm not a good enough preacher for that. And then secondly, your Christian life, your relationship with Christ is going to be enriched if you Put yourself into this, and, and if you receive this from him. So what I want to do is just lead us in a word of prayer, and then we'll continue this morning. So let's just, just pray. And, and Lord, I, I do pray that you would, in this time, speak to our hearts. I'm going to assume, Father, that a lot of these folks have some of the same issues that that I face and things that draw my attention away and and I need to be brought back we need to be brought back Lord to the moorings of our faith and we ask that you would this morning in this event set our feet on solid ground I pray that not just in the letter but in the spirit Spirit of your command that we would do this in remembrance of you. I pray that it'll speak to whatever it is that we're struggling with, that it'll give us perspective. Lord, we are in a world that has war. We're in a world that has political divide. We're in a world where we struggle just because there's so many things vying for our attention. So please bring us back to center.
Help us to come back to who we are as followers of Christ. In the simple, in the simple act we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I have a confession to make this morning, but we all do, right? Uh, when we take the bread and the juice, it really is a statement of confession. Uh, when we as a church come together at the table, now obviously these have been different days, and so our table is a little different, hopefully Lord willing, this is the last time we'll use these, but um, when we come together, we come to be a part of what Dietrich Bonhoeffer calls the fellowship of the undevout. Um, in other words, there is no way for us to receive this other than as sinners, right? Bonhoeffer said being a part of this communion is all about the grace of the gospel, it confronts us with the truth and says you are a sinner, a great desperate sinner. Now come as the sinner that you are to the God who loves you. He wants you as you are. He doesn't want anything from you, a sacrifice, a work. He wants you alone. Now that honesty is hard sometimes to come by. Dane Orland said it's the most counterintuitive aspect of Christianity that we are declared right with God not once we begin to get our act together, but once we collapse into honest acknowledgement that we never will. Now we keep thinking that we have to do something to prove our worthiness before God when the whole reason that Christ came was... Because even if we tried, anything and everything we would do would never add up. It would never measure up. You say, yeah, but doesn't Paul say, but first examine yourself so that you don't come to the table in an unworthy manner? He does. But he isn't saying you have to earn your right to be at the table. What he's saying is that you'll miss the joy and the meaning and the richness of it all if we are so consumed with self and so consumed with our own sinfulness that we forget what Christ has done for us. We examine ourselves so that we can see ourselves as we really are, how unworthy we are. And in doing that, we come to see how worthy Jesus is. And we see him for who he really is and understand the depth of what he did for us in our unworthiness. So receiving these elements is a confession that we're sinners, incapable of making ourselves saved. Prodigals who have come to the end of ourselves and we are claiming the wondrous beauty of God's grace. But secondly, when we partake of this today, we're not only confessing our sinnerliness, is it sinnerliness? We're also confessing his substitution, right? Because to, to confess our sinfulness is to confess that we need somebody to do for us what our sin disqualifies us from doing ourselves. And so in the bread and the juice, we remember that Christ is God incarnate, God in the flesh. The bread signifies his body, a body with bones that would break, a body with, with muscle that would bruise and skin that would bleed that he was falsely accused and brutally beaten and crucified on the cross as a substitute for us, for our sin, so that anyone who believes on him might be rescued from the just wrath of God. And the juice, the juice represents his blood that was shed 
for our sin. Not his own. He did not have sin. That's why he could be our substitute. John Stott writes, and he said, the concept of substitution lies at the heart of both sin and salvation. Right? Because the essence of sin is man substituting himself for God. But the essence of salvation is God substituting himself for man. So the bread and the cup are to remind us that when he hung on Calvary's cross, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, was doing what we could not do and was dying in our place. He walked through our death. He took our condemnation. The one who had nothing in his life for which to be condemned absorbed our condemnation when we were the ones who deserved it. And then 2 Corinthians said that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And he says, not imputing their trespasses to them. That's a, a banking term that just means to put in one's account. So let's remember today that when Christ died on the cross, God took all of our sins and he put them into Jesus' account. And Jesus was, commit, was treated by God as if he actually committed those sins. But that's not all. He took not only and put our sins in his account, God took his righteousness and put it in our account. And, and, and as John MacArthur says, on the cross God treated Jesus as if he had lived our lives with all our sin so that God could then treat us as if we had lived Christ's life of pure holiness. He took our condemnation and exchange, in exchange, we received his righteousness and we contributed nothing to that. What a wondrous exchange. Alienated enemies of God and yet he took the initiative and made a way for us to be in a right relationship with him through the substitutionary death of the lamb his son. So when we come to the table, it is a tangible remembrance that the gospel is not ultimately about us and what we can or cannot do or what we will or will not do. The gospel centers on Jesus and what he has done to rescue us out of our sinnerliness. It is a confession of our sinfulness. It is a confession of Christ's substitution. And thirdly, it's a confession of Christ's sufficiency. In other words, his death and resurrection was not only sufficient for our salvation, then it is still sufficient for our life now. Right? Not, I mean, it just seems that most of us tend to have some area in our lives that we struggle with, and we struggle with believing God could forgive it. I mean, we say we're forgiven. We want to believe that with all of our hearts, but then there's that one thing, that one habit, that one sin, that one recurring issue that seems so willful, that's so ugly, and is, just feels like it's beyond recovery. And we carry it around like a ball and chain, right? Claiming to be free, but dragging that thing with us wherever we go. And that's why we need to come here and, and eat this bread and drink this juice and remember. Remember that there was nothing. There is nothing that stood outside the cross. There is nothing in the world that somehow made its way outside the efficacy of the cross. Yeah, but I've done things as a Christian that I'm sure he, 
I'm not sure he would forgive. Orland said, think about it this way. He eagerly suffered for us when we were failing as orphans. Will he cross his arms over our failure now that we're adopted children? We need to eat the bread and drink the juice and remember that his forgiveness transcends our imperfection. Actually, it's a pretty arrogant thing to think that we have a sin that Jesus can't forgive. He can forgive the sins of the whole world, but not ours. It's like no, we're special and he just can't forgive ours. No. We need to understand that what he did on the cross was sufficient. Completely sufficient. Hebrews 7.25 said, Therefore he is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him. Isn't that a wonderful phrase, to the uttermost? Right? Right? Barbara DeGood said that, that God's forgiveness, God's redemption, his cleansing reaches down into the deepest, darkest crevices of our lives, even to the places where we are most ashamed and most defeated. And, and even more than that, those crevices of sin themselves are the places where Christ loves us the most. His heart is most strongly drawn there. And so she says, he knows us to the uttermost and he saves us to the uttermost because his heart is drawn to us to the uttermost. We cannot sin our way out of his tender care. You see, regardless of how we happen to be doing, she says in the obedience department today, there's great joy and delight to be found in the fact that Jesus has trusted and obeyed in our place. And now his faith and perfect obedience are credit to, credited to us every moment of every day. To be in Christ means that whenever the Father looks at us, he sees us wrapped around with the righteousness of his Son, and he is delighted. And there's so much stuff going on in our lives, folks. There's so much stuff going on in our world. And we, we move along and we rock along and <coughs> we lose our center. We lose our perspective. And so maybe we do need to come, as Bonhoeffer said, to be a part of that fellowship of the undevoted. And we've got to receive this bread and juice as people who have need that we need Christ and that he is all sufficient for us so we confess our sin but we celebrate the Savior and then we take it that step further and we celebrate that his death and resurrection is completely sufficient for every sin and every worry and every struggle that we have because we have, in Christ, been saved to the uttermost. And so maybe this morning we need to drop that sin. We need to let go of that guilt. We need to, we need to take that worry and just place it at the foot of the cross and understand who he is. And understand what he has done for us in his death and resurrection. We need to do this today in remembrance of him. We need to center our lives again on who Jesus is and what he has done. Before we leave here today, we need to make sure we understand. That he is our hope. 
And he is our sufficiency. I don't know. I, I hope you understand what I'm saying. I need this. There are days when, as a pastor, I would do this every week, every day. Because it's easy to lose perspective. Is it not? Even in here. See, we're not just moral people meeting with a bunch of other moral people. We're followers of Christ that can come together with one bond of unity, and that's him. And our need of him. So don't just observe. Let the Holy Spirit speak to our hearts and lives as we do a very simple thing of taking this, whatever this is that we call bread, And we remember that he came and substituted himself for us. And we take this juice and we understand that from the very beginning there's no remission of sin without the shedding of blood. And if you don't do anything else today, would you be grateful? And would you just say thank you? Scripture says that Jesus took the um, bread and he gave thanks and gave it to his disciples. So bow with me if you would. and Just in a moment of quiet before him. Would you thank him? Would you enter into this meal with him and as you receive this bread thank him because he took if you were in Christ, he took your condemnation. Can never be more plainly put than in Romans 8, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We're free. Lord, please help us today. Speak to us. Be here with us. Change us. Amen. You would take this with the juice down. Please don't try to open the juice first. But take this bread and he said this is my body which is given to you broken for you crucified for you do this in remembrance of me
it says that it was in the same way that he took the cup. There was one in that room who heard that at night. Later he denied Christ, but after he was restored, he wrote, knowing that you're not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. <clears throat> he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you who through him believed in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Not in you, not in your works, but in God. So let's take this juice. And he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Father, thank you. <clears throat> Holy Spirit, please do what I cannot do and what I need myself. In Jesus' name. You know, that's the thing. Human achievement will always come up short because it's just a flawed system. Maybe the best way to explain it, you've heard it before, is with between the words do and done. The hope of our salvation has already been done for us in Christ. That's why Jesus cried out, it is finished. It is done. Right? The transaction was completed and God raised him from the dead to show his approval to show his power and to give us the promise of eternal life in Christ. But we receive that by opening our heart in faith. Kind of like opening your hand to receive something. But when you open your hand to receive it, you have to let go of everything else that's there. Right? When you open your heart, you are you're giving up your pride, your self-sufficiency, your giving him your sin, and then with all of your heart, you ask. I don't know who here may have never come to that point of trusting Christ, whether you're watching online or here, but you need to have that opportunity because there is nothing more important than your relationship with Christ. That's the center. That's, that's when there, nothing else is making sense. Is there any hope? Yeah, there is hope. It's in Jesus. So if you've never responded in faith to Christ, open your heart today in a simple act of faith. So let's pray again so that people may have that opportunity. And maybe just in this time, you would pray, Dear Jesus, I, I know I need you, and I want to meet you at that point of the cross. I know I cannot save myself that I'm a sinner. And I know that you died for me, that you took my place and my condemnation. And I know that you were risen from the dead. Please forgive me. And I turn from my way and I turn to you.
Come into my life and save me today, Jesus, as I surrender everything to you. With all my life, I want to follow you. And I thank you, Jesus, for saving me today. Father, I pray for those who have heard this or will hear this. The Lord, your spirit would move and confront us with the truth and draw us to Christ and give us forgiveness and bring us into your family. In Jesus' name, amen. If today you prayed that or you want to know more information about that, let me know. Talk to House. Talk to me. If you're online, there's a form you can fill out, and we'll get that, pray with you, and encourage you, and answer any questions that you might have on what that means to be follower of Jesus Christ. This is the week before Easter. It is a wonderful time. And so I ask that you just in your hearts prepared, but as House mentioned earlier, invite somebody. There are people who you can invite them to Easter and they'll come Easter because they expect you to invite them. In many cases, they're waiting for you to invite them. So bring them with you next Sunday morning and let's celebrate together. Now today, as we get ready to go, we're going to do just a little bit different. We're going to sing a little more in the chorus. We're going to sing a whole song we're moving up in the world. But guess we are so glad you're here. Make everybody feel welcome. Let's give Christ the praise in all of this. Let's stand together and let's worship as we prepare to go.
Oh 